guest today is Ed Testerman, partner at King Street Capital Management. King Street has been in the alternative space for over 25 years and is a leading global alternative asset manager specializing in multi-strategy credit investing. Thanks so much for joining me in the studio, um, Ed. King Street has a long track record since uh, 1995, and we know that at King Street you specialize, amongst many things, dis in dislocations. And you know, speaking of dislocations, we've got the Fed that has raised interest rates by 500 basis points. So we've got rates higher, we've got spreads wider. So my first question to you is where is the dislocation today? Where are you finding it? Well, first, thanks so much for having me. Uh, at an index level, it's interesting. For high yield and investment grade credit with spreads at 450 and, and 150 basis points, we're not really seeing much in the way of dislocation in those markets. Now, on a single name basis, when you peel back the onion, we oftentimes see dislocations at various points in time throughout a cycle. So if, if you just look back to March of this year, right? Right. Within a 10 day period, we saw Silicon Valley Bank effectively fail and the market lose confidence in Credit Suisse. You know, that was a material dislocation that, that took place in a very short period of time. Yeah. The and if I may, for those who are not familiar with, you know, how do you play this sort of situations to the extent that you're able to share? How did you, you know, invest in that particular dislocation? Yes. Yeah, so, so not to get into to super specific details, but from a from a you know underwriting perspective, we spend a lot of time looking at the individual balance sheets of the banks from a fundamental perspective, working with our traders to understand where we can actually source liquidity in the markets across bonds. And on the capital market side, you know, engaging with various counterparties to understand you know, where we could source risk. And then from a legal perspective, really understanding the docs, how the various securities interacted with each other to understand you know, where the best place in the capital structure would be to deploy capital. And, you know, and a lot of people still worry about the banking crisis, right? It seems like it's come and gone, but still there's this concern in the market that maybe it's not actually gone, maybe it's still playing out. So were you also finding opportunities in other parts of the banking system where you did see that dislocation? Are you still finding those opportunities there? I'd say there's probably less in the way of acute opportunities, you know, within the banking system today. And now, you know, that can obviously change over time. But when yeah. we look at, you know, where we're finding opportunity and dislocation today, I, I would point to, to the leveraged loan market. Uh, as we take a step back and think about that asset class, we're seeing dislocations from both a technical and a fundamental perspective. So when we think about technicals, CLOs represent 70% of the levered loan market today, and those are rating sensitive vehicles. Right. And when we look under the hood, approximately 5% of holdings in CLOs right now are triple C rated. Now CLOs mm. have a sensitivity to owning triple C loans, and if they ultimately get above seven and a half percent, there's a real technical where they're forced sellers of loans, and we've started to see that play out. Now, what's what's even more interesting is 25% of the leveraged loan market is single B. So if you assume that a quarter of single B credits are downgraded to triple C over the next year or two, that triple C basket within CLOs goes from 5% to 12%. So which we would see, generate the forced selling. Correct, which, which, would, which would force you know pretty massive selling across that ecosystem. At the same time, from a fundamental perspective, we've seen interest costs double for a lot of issuers in the space. We're seeing an upcoming maturity wall of almost 300 billion over the next three years. We've seen in deals that have gotten done over the last several years, less in the way of equity and subordinated debt cushions. So LTVs are actually higher than they have been in the past and credit docs that are fairly weak. And so right. covenants that can ultimately be taken advantage of in terms of coming up with, with new liquidity solutions or other liability management exercises that are dilutive to, to existing loans. So you think the broadly syndicated, publicly traded leveraged loan market is not just a dislocation, but this is a potential distressed opportunity. So you think there's going to be higher defaults. And I guess my question is, how are you approaching that opportunistically? You know, are you shorting parts of it? Are you, you know, finding credits that are particularly attractive? How are you thinking about that? Yeah, so, so there's $250 billion of, of levered loans today that yield north of 12%. There's 125 billion of loans that trade less than 80 to at late, less than 80 cents on the dollar. So as we think about hmm. the true distressed opportunity set within the leveraged loan universe, we're getting very excited. Now, the reality is you've got to be very selective. You've got to be very focused on your individual security underwriting because there is quite a bit of dispersion in the leveraged loan market right now. Just to give you an example, we're we're very focused on the healthcare sector as an example. Okay. 15% of the leveraged loans in the healthcare sector are distressed. 15%. Right? And when I say distressed, 
they're either trading at a at greater than a thousand basis point spread to treasuries or they're trading at a dollar price lower than 80 cents on the dollar. Now, when I tell people that, people are typically surprised because health healthcare is viewed as defensive. Indeed. Right? Healthcare is typically acyclical or countercyclical. But the reality is we've dealt with an environment in that sector over the last two years where labor costs have inflated pretty massively, but there has not been a corresponding increase in reimbursement from government and commercial payers for those healthcare service providers. Right. And so margins have taken a pretty massive hit. Liquidity has come under pressure because of some of the you know, issues I described earlier around interest costs and, and otherwise. And so that's created what we think is a really compelling opportunity at a time where we think margins are actually troughing for a lot of the companies in that in that space. It, it, it's such a great point about healthcare because a lot of people think of it as pharma and you know which is defensive. But you're right, the margins in the services sector within healthcare are so thin. So it makes sense to kind of approach that as an opportunity from a, a credit perspective. But you know, a lot of people I feel like are flagging the concern about the leveraged loan market. But maybe you know there's not been as much concern about the high yield market. So. And if I, when I looked the other day at sort of the percentage of triple C, you know, high yield bonds that are trading, let's say, below 85 cents on the dollar, it's a really high percentage. I mean, I'm talking like 80, 90 percent. Yep. Is that an anomaly? Is that an opportunity? Yeah. So, so we oftentimes at King Street say that, that the worst go first when we enter a distress cycle. And what that means is the worst companies ultimately end up filing for bankruptcy, bankruptcy first. To give you a sense in the leveraged loan market to start this year, there's been a handful of defaults. Loan recoveries have been 20% on average. That mm -hmm. compares to historical levels of, of north of 60%. So that gives you a sense of the, the quality of companies that we're seeing default. Within the high yield space, the ratio of triple C spreads to double, to double B spreads are in the 96th percentile of levels that we've seen over the last 20 years. That's so that gives, you, that gives <laughs> you a sense of the dispersion. Unprecedented almost. Yeah, the dispersion that we're seeing within the high yield market and the quality of some of those lower quality uh, you know, bonds in, in the high yield space. And so our expectation is, yes, we are going to see more defaults over the next several years. You know, our expectation is a lot of those will ultimately end up shaking out in the leveraged loan space rather than the high yield space because of, you know, you're talking smaller businesses, typically lower quality businesses, you know, when you compare the two. And so that's ultimately where we, where we think we'll see a, a much larger default cycle but there will be opportunities in high yield as well. Right, so while you're sitting and patiently waiting for the default cycle to fully unfold, I know that you know, taking some selective shorts is also part of your approach. Um, so give us a couple of examples of what are you particularly negative on now, so much so that you're willing to short it. Yeah, so there's, there's three primary areas that we're spending time on the short side. The, the first is trying to identify companies that, that we say are secularly challenged. So they either lack pricing power or they're experiencing volume decline. So, so their revenue is not able to grow as fast as their expenses. And so they're experiencing you know, margin pressure, similar to what we've seen you know, in the healthcare space, but that's a very temporary issue. These, these secular decliners are, are businesses that we think margins will decline consistently over time. The second bucket are businesses that are very cyclical in nature. Right. So their securities are not pricing in a high probability or even much of a probability of a recession. And we think that, you know, based on where historical trading prices have been in those securities, that doesn't make a lot of sense to us. The third bucket would be capital structures that are highly levered, where we're seeing the potential for real cash burn from the individual companies. And we think there's going to be a, a real issue ultimately being able to refinance those capital structures over the next several years if they have near-term maturities. Yeah. Now, to give you a sense of some of the industries that we're focused on, you know, we use broadcasters as an example. Broadcasters are ad exposed businesses, highly cyclical, and they're losing share to streaming. So that's a good example of kind of the cyclical and the secular challenges within one business. You know, on, on the cyclical side, mm -hmm. we're, we're short, you know, airlines and autos and certain names within, within home building and building products. So that, just to give you a sense, those are, those are some of the types of situations that we're focused on. Well, it sounds like there's no shortage of shorts <laughs> to go around. Uh, these, are, these are great examples. But to kind of go back to where we started, which is the regional banking crisis, and what does that do to the credit environment? I mean, you look at, you know, what those regional banks are doing in terms of lending, they're paring back that net lending pretty severely. You know, you have commercial and industrial loans that are net lending is now in negative territory. 
category uh, for the last four week four week period. Same thing for CRE. So what does that do to the credit environment and maybe maybe opportunities? And specifically, can private credit step in and fill the void that maybe might be left by some of these regional banks? Yes. Yeah, so, so tightening lending standards, not new, right, um, amongst the broader banking sector, but. More specifically, in, in the in the regional banking space, much more of an acute issue today than, than we've seen in some time, and so that creates issues for companies that need to address their capital structures. It creates real opportunity for private private credit providers, and so if you just take a step back and think about the real estate space as a perfect right. example, right? There's a trillion plus of CRE maturities coming due in the next year. That was going to be a problem from a refinancing perspective before we faced a regional banking crisis in March of this year. Right. Regional and local banks represent 30% of CRE lending. So you have a big chunk of that market that is pulling back on, on their lending, and that opens the door for firms like King Street and other, other private credit providers to step in and, and provide capital solutions to a market that is, that is really challenged, right? right. Where, where cap rates are higher, valuations are lower, and, and you have real balance sheet issues that we think we can step in and, and provide yeah. really interesting capital solutions well, for. I guess all the potential for distress in commercial real estate and the fact that regional banks are pulling back is good news for private credit. And private credit is good news for real estate, perhaps. Well, Ed, this has been fantastic. Thanks so much for joining me at the desk today and for sharing your perspectives on the state of the global credit markets, including private credit, which really appreciate that. Mm -hmm.